thank you, Susan, and uh, thank you, Gail, and welcome here today. Um, there are few more important rights than the right to freedom of expression. Uh, yet when some of us go to work, we're asked to leave the First Amendment at the front desk. In America? How can this be? Bruce Barry is Professor of Management and Sociology at, uh, at Vanderbilt, a colleague of mine. He earned his bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of Virginia and a PhD in organizational behavior from UNC at Chapel Hill. He's been a member of the uh, faculty since 91 and he teaches uh, MBA courses in negotiation, power and influence, a sociology course addressing social issues in digital media, and various doctoral seminars in organizational behavior. He served as director of the Owens School's PhD program in management for about six years until 2004. And he's been a visiting scholar at Melbourne and Cleveland in Australia. Bruce Barry's expertise is pretty much in the psychology of interpersonal and group behavior in organizations, including power, influence, negotiation, conflict, and justice. Now I should add from watching him perform that he puts this understanding to work brilliantly at Vanderbilt in his current role as chair of faculty senate. He couldn't survive <laughs> if he couldn't <laughs> negotiate with power. In the broader profession, he's a past president of the International Association for Conflict Management. His current research explores free expression in the workplace, the connection between ethics and social identity, the role of ethics and emotion in negotiation, corporate ethics programs, and workplace rights. His work has appeared in all the major journals, from the Academic Academy of Management Review to the International Journal of Conflict Management, and he serves or has served on most of their boards. His books on negotiation, published by McGraw-Hill and Irwin, are widely adopted in colleges and universities around the world. And his most recent book, which I imagine the library here has on order, um, or else it's just been taken out because it's too popular. Um, but I couldn't see it on the desk outside. Just mention that. Is, uh, is Speechless, the erosion of free expression in the American workplace. And it's from last year, 2007. And his talk today is based on the ideas in that book. Bruce Barry is also active in local politics, serving currently as president of the board of directors of the American Civil Liberties Union of Tennessee. And he is a uh, contributing writer and blogger. In fact, you're, master, you're the first blogger I've met, actually, <laughs> in, in live, on, on political, economic, and social issues for the national scene. I got to know Bruce on our faculty senate and its committees, to which he brings unsurpassed energy and wit. He's one of the handful of colleagues at Vanderbilt who give eloquent voice to a progressive agenda. He's also one of those, those people who seem to be everywhere. And I'm delighted that today he's not everywhere, but that he could join us here at the downtown library to talk about free speech and something in the workplace. <laughs> Censorship. There we go. Is the uh, audio okay? Everyone hear me fine? Um, thanks for that generous introduction. Um, I value uh, uh, David Wood greatly as a colleague and friend, but if I'm the first blogger uh, he's met, I think he <laughs> needs to get out more. <laughs> uh, I'm one of the best ways, I think, to define the territory I'm talking about, this idea of free speech in relation to work and employment, is just to give you a bunch of examples. So I'm just going to rattle off a bunch. These are cases from the law or from uh, uh, accounts in, in newspapers and other forms of journalism. Uh, one of the most famous, I opened my book with it, in fact. Uh, so uh, in 2004, a woman in Alabama was uh, fired because her boss, a Republican, didn't like the John Kerry bumper sticker on her car in the workplace parking lot. That's a fairly dramatic example. I'm just going to whip through a bunch of others. Uh, guy who worked at a helicopter factory, defense contractor, fired because 
uh, he didn't want to cheerfully participate in a Gulf War celebration. A fellow in New Mexico who wanted to run for mayor of his, the part-time job of mayor of his very small town, was told by his employer, if you do that, we'll fire you. He ran, he won, he was fired, he sued, he lost. Uh, somebody right here in Williamson County, Tennessee, uh, who worked for an apparel company, wrote a letter to the editor of the Tennessean uh, uh, commenting on welfare policy, was fired for that. A stockbroker in Houston whose off-work hobby was working on a local ballot initiative on a political matter uh, of which his uh, uh, investment banking firm disapproved, so he was forced out of his job because of that. Um, a sewing machine operator for Goodwill Industries, who in his spare time as a member of the Socialist Workers' Party, lost his job. A school teacher writes a letter to the editor, a public school teacher writes a letter to the editor, uh, uh, commenting and criticizing some Board of Education policies um, around allocation of funds, and loses his job. That actually happened about 40 years ago, that case, but it's an important one because it's a major Supreme Court case on this issue. Um, a police officer in San Diego's off-work hobby is um, dressing himself up in a generic police uniform and then taking it off, uh, stripping and pleasuring himself uh, uh, while videotaping it and then selling those videos on eBay. <clears throat> is fired for this. Um, he argues it's artistic expression in his spare time. He loses in the U.S. Supreme Court. A couple of newspaper employees are fired because they refuse to wear anti-union buttons at management's request. Uh, a, a baggage handler for a major airline writes a letter to the editor of the newspaper in Denver uh, uh, criticizing the, uh, Delta Airlines' policies around downsizing and outsourcing and is uh, fired for that, uh, sues and fails to get his job back. Um, case from some years ago, a, an engineer at DuPont writes a work of fiction, a satire uh, of corporate life and is fired, he sues and loses. Um, an insurance company manager who in his spare time writes conservative op-ed style commentary for some online publications writes a particularly uh, invective laden anti-gay article and is fired. He claims this is religious expression protected by civil rights laws, he and the firm settle out of court. A public librarian in Kentucky wants to wear a small cross pendant while she's working the library desk, uh, which violates a policy of the library about religious symbols in public roles. She sues and wins, actually. Uh, whereas a uh, police officer in Texas who wanted to wear a small gold pin on his uniform, cross pin on his uniform, loses his job and uh, fails to get it back in court. Um, a guy in New Jersey working for a uh, convenience store. His uh, spare time hobby is selling Nazi skinhead music online. He is fired, sues, and, and, and loses. Uh, a worker at a factory in South Carolina has a Confederate flag on his toolbox, loses his job. And then there are, speaking of blogging, the, the sort of examples involving more recent forms of online technology. A flight attendant, for example, uh, was pretty famously fired uh, by her airline, Delta for uh, writing a blog called Diary of a Flight Attendant in which she uh, never named actually what airline she worked for but described her life as a flight attendant. There are several other examples of people, many other examples of people who have lost their jobs over their personal blogs, sometimes writing about their industry or their workplace, sometimes not. Um, lastly, I'll mention the South Carolina guy who uh, in his spare time did a podcast with his wife. He was fired when his employer didn't like his episode critical of organized religion. Uh, we think of the First Amendment as this sort of magical thing um, that, that almost defines the civic reality of the United States. But how is it that the First Amendment, which Americans seem to regard as this compelling, powerful force in our national political and civil libertarian consciousness, how is it that it becomes so withered and so lifeless in relation to our working lives? And the cases I've just uh, 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 listed, in not all of those cases did the employee have their speech shut down without recourse. In a few of them, there was a legal remedy that was pursued and perhaps even won. But for the most part, our free speech rights, as, as David's introduction implied, once we enter the workplace, are quite thin and minimal. How is it that that's the case, and is that a good thing? What I want to do in the short time I have is address that subject through four questions. First of all, why is it concretely that our First Amendment rights when we go to work are so limited. Secondly, I'll say a few words about 
the question, is this something that's getting worse or not? Thirdly, and most importantly, I want to talk about the question, I want to address the question of whether it matters or not. Hint, I will argue that it does. And fourthly, what can be done about it? Um, just a hint there, because I don't think I'll have time to say much about that. So my first question, why are free speech rights in relation to workers and workplaces so limited? And there are sort of two fundamental problems that, that get at the question. One is the law, and one is management, how people manage workplaces. With respect to the law, there are two pieces of law that they don't conspire, but they come together to make the, first, to make the workplace a uh, sort of First Amendment unfriendly zone. The first is a piece of constitutional law, the sort of thing that law school students probably learn in the first week of a constitutional law class, and this is the principle of state action. That's the principle that says the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and the rights guaranteed under it really only apply when it is the state that's acting. Ergo, the name, the state action doctrine. Private actors cannot infringe on your constitutional rights because constitutional rights really only apply on public property. So if you think about those examples that I uh, uh, spouted off a few minutes ago, you might start to think, oh, so that means people who are government workers who work in the public sector perhaps have more rights than people in the private sector, since if you're in the public sector, your employer is a state actor, your employer is the governor, and, and, and in fact, public sector workers do have greater First Amendment rights in relation to work or in relation to their employers than private sector workers do, although even then, the courts over the last 40 years have, have quite severely restricted those rights for public sector workers. When, when cases on free speech at work reach the federal courts and especially the Supreme Court, as they have about a dozen times over the past 40 years, those cases almost always are about public sector workplaces like, say, the stripper cop in San Diego, which is one of the most recent cases to reach the high court. Um, in the private sector, there really are no free speech rights because this state action principle says that your constitutional rights don't apply and that a private party, like a private sector employer, can't infringe upon those rights and be held to account for it. Let me just throw in one wrinkle to that um, that I'm just going to mention, which is the wrinkle that the boundary between public and private can be hazy and grows ever hazier. For example, as governments uh, persist and expand their outsourcing and privatization of traditionally public functions into private sector hands, and there's a whole um, vast jurisprudence, not just around free speech, but around that public-private divide in relation to all sorts of government services and public rights. So, so although we can say public employees have more rights than private employees, we have to keep in mind that the boundary between the two isn't always quite so clear. So if constitutional law is one piece of law that contributes, the other piece is employment law. In this country, the law of employment is governed by a principle that I'm sure many of you will have heard of called employment at will, a doctrine of, of law related to work that dates back to the late 19th century. Many would trace its origins to, in fact, a, a court case in the state courts right here in Tennessee. And the principle of, of employment at will says fundamentally that an employer can fire you for any reason, good reason, bad reason, or no reason. Um, and this is a, a uniquely American principle of employment law um, that basically gives employers the right to do away with employees for just about any reason they want, or as I say, no reason. There are many exceptions to employment at will. I'm sure many of you realize you can't fire somebody. For example, civil rights laws are probably one of the most prominent exceptions. You can't fire somebody merely because of their race, gender, sex, religion, uh, ethnic origin, age. And some state laws protect other forms of civil rights like marital status, veteran status, uh, other things such as that. There are also uh, other forms of exceptions to this rule. For example, uh, contracts. People with employment contracts will often have protections against being fired for bad reasons. And union collective bargaining agreements, another form of contract that affects this. There are also some state-by-state -state exceptions. Some states have laws that protect people from being fired, for example, for political activity. The, the woman fired for her bumper sticker in Alabama actually would have had a legal cause of action in a few states. Uh, unfortunately for her, Alabama wasn't one of them. Um, some states have laws uh, uh, that protect employees, people from being fired for their off-work activities that have nothing to do with work. Um, many states have those kinds of laws related to the use of substances like tobacco and alcohol, powerful lobbies that have gotten those laws through state houses, but actually only a handful of states have wide-ranging laws that protect people from being fired for their activities after work 
or off work. So overall, though, with this very short summary, if you take together constitutional law, state action principle, employment law, the employment at will doctrine, what you have is a legal system that by imagining that employers and workers have a kind of an equal power and by denying a role for civil liberties on private property, you have a legal system that basically leaves employees with pretty hollow rights on the job, especially free speech rights. And I want to add quickly that I don't think people are really aware of this. Uh, in a national survey about seven or eight years ago, people were asked a factual question. Can you be fired for your political opinion? And over 80% said yes, said no, said no. It is illegal to fire somebody for their political opinion. And in fact, with very few exceptions, it's quite legal in this country. Now, I said that law was one of the reasons why this is the, the state of affairs exists. And the other is management. And there's a lot to say about that, but I'm only going to say a little here. Um, I teach in a school of management, and management theory over the past, oh, I don't know, half century or so, can certainly be read broadly as a movement toward collaboration, participation, communication, delegation, cooperation in the, in the accomplishment of work. And, and this is what we teach at business schools like where I teach. Um, and I'm not going to argue that that's a sham fronting for some kind of ever-expanding corporate tyranny. Um, well, some days I argue that, but I'm not going to do that today. Um, nor am I going to argue that all employers in all workplaces are wholly unforgiving of, of, of free expression or employee dissent. Um, but the question is, have the kind of management trends I'm talking about involving autonomy and voice, justice, business ethics, have these things actually opened up the climate for employee speech? I'm not sure that they have. But are these meaningful developments, or are they just tools of managerial control that create the illusion of a freer workplace or a more liberated workplace? And, and what I have to say about that is, that is that for some companies, I think it is an illusion and a sham. But for many, it's not. It's really just a habit of managerial practice. Um, and I'll say more about that toward the end of my remarks. Um, but I think what's important to keep in mind is that for all those cases that I started my talk with, um, which I know about because they made the courts or the press, you know, nobody picks up the phone and calls a lawyer or a, or a reporter until first some manager has made some kind of decision. And so my interest here on the management side of this problem is trying to understand what is it about the cultures of workplaces and of managerial practice that lead managers to make the kinds of decisions that then subsequently lead to phone calls to reporters and to um, lawyers and ultimately the filing of lawsuits. I want to say a few words next about the second of my four questions. Is this problem getting worse? Are free speech rights for people as workers more precarious than they used to be? And, and I think there's a lot of factors that indicate they are, some having to do with the changing nature of work in the eyes of workers. For example, um, less linear career paths, uh, less job security, the shrinking likelihood that people, of course, will spend their career with one employer. Um, secondly, I'd point to what I like to refer to as a kind of a culture of layoffs. That is to say, a conventional managerial wisdom in this country these days that using layoffs and downsizing as a tool of management adjustment to changing environmental circumstances is a routine tool. It's a tool of early resort rather than necessarily a tool of late or last resort. Thirdly, something I alluded to earlier, I think maybe, the decline of unionization, union density in the private sector in this country now well under 10%. Um, certainly erodes free speech rights and other forms of workplace rights. Um, and lastly, something, uh, 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 well, I didn't refer to this before, but I'll say it now. Um, I, would, I would lastly point to um, a dissolving boundary between work and non-work. That, that is the idea that, that when you're at work and when you're on your own time, for many workers, is, is a much more of a fuzzy distinction, born partly of technology and partly of the changing nature of jobs. From an employer's perspective also, I think we see over the past 20, 30 years, employers increasingly concerned with their image, uh, what the marketing types call brand stewardship, um, concerned about image, reputation. Um, secondly, I think we see on the employer side uh, an increasing interest in influencing public policy on political, economic, social, cultural matters of all types. And what these things add up to for the employers is the greater likelihood that there's a preferred point of view on the part of the corporate employer, one from which employees depart at their peril. And so I think these also are forces that 
put employee free speech rights in greater peril, or at least make them more precarious. And I also want to say a quick word about technology. Um, all of these new tools, in and out of work, email, instant messaging, texting, blogs, wikis, websites, podcasts, and all the rest, um, you could look at this stuff and say it's a golden age for free speech. There's far more, far more speech than ever before, far more speech than many of us want some days. Um, and I think that's true. But I think that these same tools that make it possible to communicate in so many new ways with broader audiences also make it possible for employers to find that speech. You know, everything you utter electronically, and almost everything you utter electronically, is at least theoretically archivable, searchable, findable, actionable on the part of employers. Um, so I think there's a, there's a sort of a complex tension there between the way these tools liberate some expression and the way they also give employers and others the ability to police or patrol that expression. Third of my fourth points then, why does this matter? Other than maybe it'd be nice to work in a workplace where there's a little bit less tyranny and a little bit more freedom to be oneself and to express oneself. I think it matters because of the relationship that I see between work and workplace and the larger society in which we live. We live in a, in a system in the United States currently, and this is born in part of employment at will, where the relationship between a, work, a worker and his or her employer is really viewed through a lens of property rights and contracts. Employers have this right of property ownership, not just over the place they manage or the process they manage by which they, that they manage, but also over how they manage how they choose to run their workplace and their workforce. Employees in this kind of an orthodox market view of employment, we as employees, we accept the employer's conditions of work or we're forced to move on. And we have that right. Employment at will gives me the right to leave, just as it gives my employer the right to fire me. Um, in this sense, as I indicated earlier, employment law in the US is, is more deferential to these kinds of market prerogatives than employment in other countries, where, where there are usually some kinds of protections uh, for employees against being fired for something other than a just cause. Um, these core ideas, though, about it, this kind of market-based view of employment, in my judgment, collide with three different and important assumptions. Assumption number one, that freedoms to think, speak, and act are paramount values for a free society. Assumption number two, that guarantees of due process are indispensable to the existence of a just society. And assumption number three, the critical one here, that work is not necessarily something that people do merely between intervals of real life. Work is where people live out their lives. Um, not just because US workers are working more hours than ever before, which some evidence shows. Not just because the boundaries, as I mentioned a minute ago, between work and non-worker increasingly blurred for a lot of people. But because work is where people interact with other adults. For some people, it's the only place they interact with other adults. For many people, it's the only place where they interact with other adults who differ from themselves on matters of race or gender or class, religion, nationality, ethnicity, and so forth. And my point here is that work is not just where people develop their occupational identity or their professional selves. It's where they develop their civic selves. And so I think it's natural and reasonable to think of issues involving rights of work as arising from a tension uh, uh, not just between the two ideas of the needs of the worker and the needs of the employer, but as arising from a tension between three ideas. What the individual wants, what the employer's objectives are, and then the third leg of this, uh, this triangle, the aims of a self-governing democratic society. This kind of a three-way view moves past that parochial market-focused sense of employment uh, beyond a simpl simplistic idea that work is just the exchange of labor for capital, um, and with democracy being something you worry about nights and weekends. Um, what, this, what this view does is it confronts us with a larger idea, that free speech and the nature of work and the quality of democracy are somehow intertwined. And to understand this, the way to do it is to look at this connection, this connection between work and free speech, through the lens of what it means to have a healthy civil society. Uh, work. I would argue, opens up key paths to what we can imagine as associational life, civil society in the Tocquevillian sense, um, the way we make connections and build social capital. Limits to freedom of expression by employers throw obstacles in that path because work is where people build that capital. 
Now, I'm not going to argue that the kinds of nastiness that I started my talk with happen every day. People are fired for their blogs and whatnot. But I will argue that those kinds of harsh reactions to speech um, lead employees to self-censor, create a chill that reminds all of us that employers have this power under both constitutional and employment law, and they may or may not be willing to use it. Add to that the uncertainties of a modern industrial economy like the one we have now, and I think you have a serious chilling effect of the law on people's willingness to express themselves, whether or not their particular employer is going to come down hard on them. Um, and therefore, the interactions, the associations, the affiliations that spring from the workplace that build social capital and create a kind of an associational life in our communities are less likely to occur. There, there's research in political science that shows this connection between uh, interactions at work, um, the political life of individual employees at work, and their involvement in their communities at large. Um, my argument here is that when employers put pressure on workers to be silent or to conform to preferred or favored viewpoints, this sets a kind of a trap for civil society. Uh, and, a, and we're talking here about a civil society whose health depends on dissent. It takes a forceful individual to break free of coerced conventional wisdom. And, uh, and, and so I think that the regulation of speech by employers doesn't just influence organizational culture. It doesn't just make the workplace maybe a touch more tyrannical. I think it really influences what, what one legal scholar calls democratic culture, which is the ability of ordinary people to participate in, in their communities in ways that lower those barriers of rank and prestige and power that enables people to influence the institutions and the forces that, that, that shape their lives and their futures and to participate in political and literary and artistic communities without hesitation or without fear of consequences. Um, I want to very briefly, the fourth of my uh, 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 four questions I promised to address was about the remedies. What, what's the solution? And I'm only going to say a word or two about this because of the shortage of time. But just as the problem is part law and part management practice and management conventional wisdom, I think that's where the solutions lie as well. On the legal side, we might imagine that it would be nice to throw out, say, for example, the doctrine of state action in constitutional law. That's not going to happen in my lifetime. And in any case, I think there are some serious problems and unintended consequences with doing so. Nor are we likely to see the employment at will principle dissolve anytime soon. Um, so on the legal side, the best we can hope for are some incremental changes where perhaps the few states who have some reasonable laws protecting people's private expressive lives uh, might be mimicked by the vast majority of states that don't, including Tennessee, I might add. Um, but even doing that won't help unless courts are willing to shift their focus and judges are willing to look at the subject more reasonably. Because even when these good laws exist, they tend to allow a company, reasonably, to argue that, um, that its business is harmed by this activity, this, this speech by an employee or this expressive activity. And judges and juries find themselves weighing the balance. And, 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 and my reading of the law is that judges often defer way too easily uh, to employer interests here. When employers say, this action, this expressive act by this employee will harm my business, judges tend to say, hmm, well, I guess it will. And, uh, and, and so it, that kind of a shift in balance is necessary. On the management side, apart from the law, what I call for, for example, in my book is, is a change in mindset. Employers need to sort of rethink, in my opinion, the relationship between work, workplace, employee, and larger society. Um, I think free speech rights are precarious in society at large when firms instinctively treat employee uh, expression as an avoidable nuisance, as they do, many do, or as a legal liability, or a risk to their corporate reputation, or a threat to prosperity. And I, I would add that employers, because of our legal system, employers don't just escape legal difficulties when they come down hard on employee speech. They also escape moral consequences. There are business ethicists who argue, and I agree with them, that corporations, when they assert rights to economic autonomy in how they conduct their business, they incur, they incur commensurate obligations to act in moral ways toward individuals and other stakeholders in addition to employees. The right to do business as one sees fit is a reasonable one, but it doesn't occur in a moral vacuum. It comes with an obligation to respect the rights of others as moral equals, including those whom one employs. In fact, I would personally tend to privilege an individual moral claim over a corporate moral claim. 
But the point about the point of trying to reform management is that ultimately, I think, reversing an erosion of free speech rights in the American workplace is more likely to happen through persuasion rather than through compulsion uh, uh, via the law. I think employers need to reframe their roles in society from seeing themselves as they tend to now as servants to a labor market economy, instead to imagine themselves as partners or collaborators in a vibrant democratic economy, a democratic society. And I want to close by just saying um, just, just a couple of sort of almost qualifications. First of all, um, this is not a manifesto for anything goes. Employee, there's certainly employee speech that can pose a genuine threat to employing organizations. And, uh, and, and a functional free enterprise system does not require employers to tolerate all speech. I haven't touched here on the question of abusive and harassing speech, which is a very important angle on this problem. Secondly, second qualification, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. Uh, I don't, well, sometimes I am, but I'm not today. I don't see uh, here a sinister collective assault on the Bill of Rights by corporate America. I suspect that most managers, executives, business owners probably think the First Amendment's a pretty good idea. Uh, but what I do see them doing is taking what the law and management practice and conventional economic morality give them, which is this right to be reflexively suspicious of employee behavior that departs from expectations. Um, and thirdly, and finally, uh, there is an inescapable balance here, and, and I think you can hear it in a lot of my comments, between employee and employer. I argue that freedom of speech, rights to due process, should not lose their significance for both the individual and for society when someone goes to work and enters the workplace door. But at the same time, I acknowledge that a free society does mean giving private institutions, not just individuals, quite a good measure of freedom and discretion uh, uh, from government interference. And therein lies the tension and the balance and the hard problems. It might be easy for many to agree that firing somebody for a, for a Bumper, political bumper sticker on their car is outlandish and outrageous. But the hard case, that's not a hard case. The hard cases occur really at the, at the nexus of this balance between employers and employees. Thanks. This, uh, this employment at will doctrine seems to me to make perfect sense if, if you've just got like one guy who wants some help doing something and he hires somebody else and uh, doesn't like them. So you think, well, that's good. Surely we want to be able to protect his right to hire somebody else instead of the person he doesn't like. I mean, that seems, that uh, seems sort of intuitively uh, real. But when we start thinking about um, corporations and um, publicly traded companies. I mean, these are sort of really strange social inventions. They are often uh, limited liability companies so that they, they can actually incur huge debts and not have to pay them back if they go bankrupt, as I understand it. They are legal persons, which means they have actually the protection of the First Amendment, which is kind of interesting. So they, they have enormous... Um, they're not, they don't just exist in, in the natural world. These are you know, social inventions, these, these businesses. And am I right in thinking that one of the sort of bottom line parts of your argument is that these real fictions, these inventions called corporations, because they in a sense are floating on um, uh, the uh, creativity of, of, of a society that that allows them to exist and that protects their, their existence in certain ways and gives them privileges, that there is some sort of built-in requirement, whether it's moral or legal, to um, not exactly give back, but to um, embody in the workplace that they uh, open up to their employees um, certain kinds of values. In other words, it's not just like the situation I began with, where you've just got one guy hiring somebody else, but that there are enormous privileges attached to these um, to corporations and public traded companies. Well, that's a, I guess philosophers ask huge questions. <laughs> <laughs> that's a huge question. Um, 
I was just trying to get at what I thought you were saying. <laughs> um, well, I, I, you know, I have two comments on that. One is that, in, in some sense, the conversation here is about, it is no different from any other aspect of the, the so-called regulation of so-called free enterprise. Um, that, uh, that we imagine that a functioning free enterprise system, a, a vibrant market economy, means letting corporations and other employers, letting them do what they, what they think they can and should do in order to be successful with only the regulation that's necessary to meet appropriate public policy purposes. Um, and that's always a reasonable conversation to have. It's always a difficult one. Uh, it's a conversation that is not helped um, when people just sort of hide behind the idea of a free market or a free enterprise system because there's no such thing. I mean, you know, re regulation is what defines the ability of the free enterprise system to exist, right? I mean, uh, uh, if we were to imagine this, this, this institution we're sitting in the public library as a private corporation, um, it couldn't sort of throw me off its property as a trespasser unless it had those laws granting it private property rights and uh, granting law enforcement powers that it can avail itself of. I mean, the, the point of the weird example here is that there's just this whole maelstrom of, of, of regulatory mechanisms and machines that surround the so-called free enterprise system. So it's always, these conversations are always about where to draw lines and how far to go. Um, and, and I think that's, that's no different here um, but what is different is if we say that we want to regulate in order to serve public policy objectives, it's fascinating to me that we don't ever really think of people's individual civil liberties, rights to privacy, rights against unreasonable search and seizure, rights to free expression. We don't see these as public policy objectives, if you will, um, except in relation to the narrow way that the Constitution is construed as protecting those rights against infringement by government. And so I think the big philosophical answer, or the big philosophical follow-on question to your question, is how should we imagine these rights in a society, which by the way the framers of the Constitution perhaps couldn't have imagined, in a society where we live huge parts of our lives under the control of, control might be too strong a word, but in the domain of large, powerful, private institutions. Because what this is really about is the fact that on private property we have no, no rights, no free speech rights, and private property is where we spend a whole lot of our time. Let me ask you then another uh, question. Um, I'm wondering whether you think there might be uh, different rules for different kinds of workplace. And I'm thinking uh, of two sort of extreme cases. One would be colleges like Vanderbilt, and the other would be the military. And I'm going to give you just a, an example. Um, in the run-up to the Iraq war, our previous Chancellor McGee explicitly spoke out in support of the various uh, pieces of dissent and the uh, quite um, lively discussions that were going on campus, going on on campus and said, this is what a campus is for. And he pretty much was saying it wasn't just our right to say pretty well anything we wanted to say. It was even, I mean, almost saying it was our duty uh, as, a, as, a, as an academic institution to um, bring up this multiplicity of viewpoints and to vigorously discuss them uh, in the corridors and under the trees. And, um, and you, you could, and I think when he said this, he was actually drawing on a vision or an idea of what uh, this kind of community was about. It was actually, uh, you know, if you didn't express yourself, you were somehow failing you know, as a student or as a faculty member. Now, the opposite end, the extreme, I'm thinking about the military. Um, and I'm just wondering whether, you know, the, the silencing of dissent might be thought to be a kind of operational necessity. Um, um, I mean, did, did you, can you see that, that I mean, you, you said it's an issue of drawing a line. Well, well the, 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 courts, the courts have treated the military, and not just the military, but, but so-called militaristic type organizations, police right. departments, fire departments, and such. Where, although 
public sector employees have some free speech rights, although they're quite limited by various circumstances. When those cases have reached the courts and they've involved not just any old government worker, but a member of a police department or a fire department or the military, the courts have shown extra deference there to the employer, have said that those kinds of organizations have a need for a sort of command and control type structure and, uh, and uh, th that there are special circumstances that justify extending even fewer rights to expression um, to employees in those situations. So, so the courts have already carved them out as separate. On the other extreme, universities, well, universities are sort of oddball places. Um, in some sense, they're not. In some sense, they're places of employment like any other. Vanderbilt's a private university, it's a private institution. Uh, the chancellor can fire anybody he wants um, for just about any reason he wants. Um, but universities have a few uh, features that do make them distinctive rather than, rather than ordinary like that. One is, well, affecting a small number of employees at the university, there is the tenure system, um, which, which is essentially a contractual right, is the way to think about it, that comprises an exception to employment at will. I'm a tenured professor. Um, that doesn't, people think of that as employment for life. What it really means is a due process protection. Um, I assure you as a tenured professor, I can still be fired if I do, you know, molest undergraduates or whatever it is that might uh, lead um, uh, to a just cause claim. But, um, but that's the kind of protection it, it, it provides. But what's interesting about universities is even for those without the protection of contracts or tenure, um, universities, as, as the statement that you recounted from former Chancellor Gee, Universities tend to kind of create for themselves and abide by an ethos of, of civil liberties and of free expression because it's sort of a, a value that they stand for. Um, does that mean that a university chancellor will tolerate all manner of free speech that other employers won't? Well, perhaps not. But they do put themselves in a kind of a cultural position of being more tolerant of free speech. Vanderbilt certainly has and does. I know many untenured members of the Vanderbilt community who speak out on all kinds of issues, maybe even hold rallies on campus for living wage issues and other things, and they do so pretty much without fear of consequences as long as they're doing their job. And I think that's a good thing. And so in that case, I wish other employers would look more like universities, to the extent possible. I don't expect the general manager of the Kroger on 8th Avenue to announce that you know this is a free speech zone and we welcome a lot of anti-war protesting in the produce aisle. Um, but you know I'd like to imagine a world where that might even at least be plausible. Okay, now we'll get it. I think I'll leave it at that, and um, we will um, solicit questions from the floor. Do we have a, a mic handy? Is it this one? Yeah. Chancellor Gee had to tolerate the uh, free speech of his wife, as I remember. But anyway, <laughs> that's not my point. Uh, I want to know if you find what I have found working with different corporations, and that is maybe the flip side of what we're talking about. A uh, corporation distinguishes itself with its vision and its core values that determines their uniqueness. But they seem to shut down by innuendo or policy the creativity they need to actually distinguish themselves and separate themselves. That's what I find in a number of corporations, and I appreciate your point on that as well. Thank you. Yes, the lady right at the back then. Uh, gentlemen. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, this is a separate question. My question had to do with Ward Churchill, and I wondered if you were familiar with Ward Churchill's case, in which uh, I believe he was a tenured professor at the University of Colorado, and they concocted a a uh, whole uh, side issue to challenge his tenure. Do, do you have any uh, comment about that? Okay, thank you. Um, any more questions? For, yes, lady here. Do you find with employers um, talking about the free speech of employees, does that vary based upon the rank of the employee within the company, whether they're an hourly worker, a salaried worker, or say a vice president or CEO? That's a great question. Okay, thank you. Yes, this lady over here. Could it be that we've outgrown the traditional 
labor management union model? And do you foresee a different model that would both protect the rights, the civil liberties, and at the same time uh, become a more collaborative process? Could you pr provide a few examples of the kind of persuasion that you see as effective with making these kinds of corporate changes you mentioned? Any more questions for our speaker? No, no, no. You can get one more. I think we have room for one more. Yes, let it go. I challenge you on how often the, what did you call it, the uh, labor, the state, state action, no, that's public property. I challenge you how often a corporation can fire, find just cause, because of all the steps that management must pursue in order to make firing possible. And sometimes, legally, um, are advised not to follow through. Okay. Thank you very much. I think we should uh, give our speaker an opportunity to answer some of these questions. Oh, we're not conveniently out of time yet? Okay. Um, I love this approach of taking several questions. I, you know, I, I wish I could respond by saying, uh, yes, no, no, yes, maybe, and sometimes. Um, Corporations shutting down creativity, that first question. Um, well, I, I think some do, some don't. Um, one of the things that I, I believe is that corporations imagine, what, what happens is corporations imagine themselves to be laboratories for input and dissent and collaboration. Part of the research I did for my book involved reading a lot of corporate documents um, in which they talk about some of this stuff. Um, my concern is, but, but, but everybody, Who's or most people who've worked for large corporations know that input and dissent and creativity are valued, but often only on, on their terms. That is the right kind of creativity and the right kind of dissent. Of course, though, there are exceptions. I mean, certainly there are companies that really do nourish creativity, uh, encourage it, and reward it. And I don't want to paint too broad a brush here. Um, you know, there are plenty of good places to work out there where your free speech rights really aren't in jeopardy. But I think that, that question does highlight a problem, which is, you know, what, what, what employers, corporations are really concerned about is not your views for or against the war in Iraq. They're interested in your ability to be a sort of a contributing member who brings good ideas to the table. And, and that's as much a part of the picture for them. Ward Churchill, the Colorado professor who got in trouble for very provocative post 9-11 comments. And he was a tenured professor who couldn't be fired for very provocative post 9-11 comments. But then what, what uh, the questioner referred to as a concocted side issue um, was plagiarism in his scholarly work. And I guess observers of that situation debate whether that side issue of plagiarism, which was very exhaustively investigated, was or was not concocted. Um, I don't have a, a, an informed opinion about whether the plagiarism charges have merit, except that I did look at the final report, and it, it seemed fairly persuasive. Um, but this was clearly a case where that investigation into his scholarly uh, credibility and integrity wouldn't have even occurred had it not been for the provocative post 9-11 comments. So was Ward Churchill the victim of a kind of a free speech witch hunt as a result of speaking out provocatively? I think so to an extent, but did Ward Churchill also comport himself in ways that kind of invited this? I think that's true also. I, I see his case as, as kind of complicated. I guess I see sort of no innocence, no innocent parties really completely in that situation. But that's, that's a view from afar. Um, the great question, does, does employer tolerance for speech vary with rank, lower level employees versus higher level employees? And I, I, and I don't have you know, solid empirical evidence, but, but the, the, the research I have done and, and the thinking I've done about this leads me to believe that the relationship between tolerance for free speech and rank is not so obvious. Um, we might think that lower level employees, for example, are at greater risk, and the big shots can talk about whatever they want 
But there are a couple of forces that work in reverse of that. Um, the big shots are more likely to be victims of what we can call compelled speech. That is, they're more likely to be put in a position where they need to adopt and project that preferred party line. Think about uh, one of the best examples of this are, is the uh, uh, expansion in the last several years of corporate PACs, political action committees, which by law are voluntary opportunities for executives to contribute to a fund, a political action fund, that then doles out contributions to candidates. There was one recent survey that showed a very large number of, of executives regarding the so-called voluntary PAC contributions as not particularly voluntary if they value their future career prospects. So I think there, there are problems that exist both at high and low level ranks. Uh, this question, um, I'm going to have to probably beg off the question, uh, have we outgrown a traditional labor union management model in favor of a more collaborative workplace where it's all governed differently? And I have to beg off because that's like a three hour question. <laughs> um, and I'm not even sure I'm, I'm, I'm the expert, you know, I have the expertise uh, to talk in, in depth about it. Um, what I would say only very briefly is that yeah, maybe, you know, you can regard the sort of conventional labor union form, certainly the numbers in union density show it's, it's diminishing, um, but, but I would argue that the issues behind unionism, they never change. I mean, people organize collectively worldwide in order to gain certain very fundamental basic rights, uh, living standards, working conditions, uh, employee rights, and those things don't change or go out of style. Um, and, uh, and, and there are conventions of the International Labor Organization regarding workplace rights, for instance. There's a convention of the International Labor Organization that was adopted several years ago that says that the countries that sign this convention agree that you should not be able to, there should be no employment discrimination based on the usual suspects here, race, sex, religion, and included in the ILO convention, political opinion. There should be no employment discrimination based on political opinion. 160 countries have signed that convention. The United States is not one of them. Uh, I know we're almost out of time. Uh, a few examples as to how to persuade, do the kind of persuasion I'm talking about. Well, I'm not sure I have much of an answer for that. I mean, I, I wrote the book as, and I've done some other publishing in this area and some writing and some management journals on this, that's, that's kind of my form of persuasion to try to get people to think about it. Um, I'm, I'm open to suggestion uh, in other ways. Uh, it, it, that's a terrific question that, that sort of puts me at a loss. And then lastly, the challenge, um, and I think that challenge is really important. You're, you're saying, you can't fire people. It's impossible to fire people. There are so many steps, so many legal risks. The lawyers are telling us, never fire anybody. If you have to get rid of them, package them out, give them a severance package, make them go away. So why are we so worried about employment at will and the idea that people can be fired for any reason? And I think that's a, that's a, that's a valid point. The reason it doesn't, um, for me, overcome the concern is because even within those constraints, um, I think we still see employers uh, or employees experiencing job detriments, whether it's firing or failure to gain promotions or falling in disfavor um, as a result of their opinions or their expressive activities, and especially the fear that that can happen. So although I actually agree it is hard in many industries uh, to fire somebody um, and many circumstances, and employers would much rather not do that, I still think that the chill on employee speech is, is present and quite prominent and, and a source of concern. And I got all of them. Thank you so Under much. Budget. Thank you. I think we should, um, we should thank the library for, for letting Bruce say these outrageous things. <laughs>